Now, I'm very happy to introduce you Mike Egan. Um, Mike's been a friend of mine for many, many years, but many of you will know him um, through his activities in the restaurant business in Wellington. He's been the national president of the uh, Restaurant Association for some 11 years now. He's also the mastermind behind Wellington on a Plate uh, and has been involved in that all the years of its existence and is on the trust that oversees its activities now. Um, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry generally, is one we're all sort of familiar with, but in actual fact, most of us know nothing about it at all. Uh, we don't know what its size is, we don't know how many people it employs, we don't know how many people go in and out of business a year. Um, Mike's going to tell you all that today, and so when you go out of here you'll have a new affinity with the hospitality business and realise that it's the pennies that come out of your pocket that keep these restaurants going. So just change your habits, stop cooking at home, and start eating out. <laughs> so, Mike Egan. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. I, I know quite a few of you from being customers and seeing you around the traps. Imagine you, started, uh, you decided to start a small manufacturing business. You're going to make a variety of products, say 30 to 40, and they are designed to sell for the most part between $15 and $35. You're not precisely sure what will sell well and what amounts, but you have to nonetheless be able to produce these products and expected levels of consumption, all the while staying flexible in case some don't actually sell and productive capacity has to be shifted to other products. Imagine also that each of these products need to be assembled using multiple parts of raw, highly perishable products that have to be assembled within small tolerances to work properly. Now assume that to have any chance of profitability, the factory will have to operate multiple shifts, seven days a week, so that different people will be manufacturing the same products on different days, each with a different skill level and training background. And because of the labour pool market, the employees may be speaking different languages, may only work for the factory for a number of weeks so that you are constantly training new staff. This business is also located in high rental cost inner city locations where due to the manufacturing process it produces large levels of waste including used oil, glass, cardboard, food scraps, airborne emissions that have to be filtered and vented out of the top of the building. Then to add even more stress to the business model, the customers are asked to consume these finished products in the manufacturing facility where they are made. Not only that, these customers are present in the manufacturing facility for a number of hours and during this time they're having dozens of service contacts and any one of which could go wrong and ruin the occasion for them. And then to top it all off, these customers are offered and consume intoxicating beverages from the time they arrive until the time they leave. <laughs> Not many business models require such contrasting duality and flexibility being the just-in-time manufacturer, and then the total user consumption experience. Looking dispassionately at this model, you would have to wonder why anyone would want to go into business. Why would anyone want to frequent this schizophrenic business as a customer? However, John Banville, who writes for the Dubliner, he said the reason why we go to restaurants, he put it very succinctly. He said, surely the restaurant is one of civilization's great achievements. Since it was not there, the French had to invent it. Long before the revolution, a restaurant was a cauldron of restorative stew into which for a few cents customers plunged their bowls and helped themselves and very soon a caught on elsewhere. As how would it not? The idea being so simple and sweet that one may, for a relatively small outlay of cash, walk freely into someone else's dining room, be greeted by an affable, clean and well-dressed person who will smilingly show you to a table, offer you a drink, take diligent note of what you would like to eat, and then go and fetch it for you, all the while pretending to be your friend. <laughs> a remarkable freedom and a rich pleasure unique in this veil of tears. For the first time in history, 50% of humanity now reside in urban areas. The number is set to grow. By 2050, they think it will be 80% of us will be living in cities. Urban areas will become and are becoming more important as this is where we will thrive. So what roles will restaurants play in this future crowded urban framework? And I believe they will play a vital role. New Zealand has 17,200 hospitality businesses with 130,000 employees. We turn over $11 billion a year 
and our growth for the last three years was 9.7, 8.5 and 3.6%. So why is this our healthy growth? Because eating together is innate. It is how we connect as a tribe and what and where we eat is a major part of how we see ourselves. Restaurants and cafes play a unique role in the urban environment. They are in fact public living rooms. We access them and use them in a whole variety of ways and for a variety of reasons. We use them for business, social events, for sustenance, mating rituals, celebrations, friendship maintenance, mood enhancement, to ma maintain eating or drinking disorders, and even for curiosity's sakes. We can be present in, them for just 30, present in them for just 30 minutes and enjoy that long, long lunch that can even turn into, or enjoy that long, long lunch that can turn into dinner and you are the last to leave. So paradoxically, while we are crowding into urban environments, more of us are tending to live alone. In cities like Helsinki and Paris, the number of people living alone has risen to over 40%. And sociologists call this phenomenon a together alone. And this is why the public living room, our restaurants and cafes, are an important institution by providing a venue for the non-work social connections that we all desire and need. An increasingly in an increasingly digital world, we look for and crave compensatory analogue experience. And what is a better expression of analogue than sharing a meal with friends, families or colleagues? So the future for us is to make our offer that can help satisfy this need for a unique analogue experience. There's also a new retail paradigm going on, and us as restaurateurs, we are actually retailers as well. And the paradigm is retailing is essential, but retailers are not. We don't want to be like high street retailers and just become showrooms for internet purchasing. Our customers are also moving from ownership model to experience. So for example, the vast majority of millennials believe they will never actually own a car. And if they do need one, they'll just rent it for an hour a day a week. The experience is everything. So it's not about sales per square metre, but it's about experience per square metre. Adidas recently did a pop-up in London for a limited edition basketball shoe and they displayed them really high up in the shop and the only way you could get ones you had to be able to jump high enough to reach them and get them. And of course they live streamed it around the world to all their, all their fans. So the demand for real life experience is also clearly demonstrated in the amazing uh, worldwide growth of tourism. People, especially millennials, are wanting to spend money on experiences like travel rather than things. This is a generation that don't want to own lots of stuff but they want to travel, and when they're not travelling, they're eating out. So what are some of the mega trends that I think will influence the future New Zealand restaurant? Uh, time, this is a customer's shortest resource. So this means an increase in brand importance, as trust in brands means there is less risk with their time. Restaurants, of course, of course, carefully choose every facet of their brand, their menu, their music, location, ideal staff profiles, sequence of service, and so on. But the key for them is it to be consistent and then concentrate on that consistency for every customer at every service. This ability means that we will never risk the customer's time as we deliver the brand every time. So therefore customers need to have belief and knowledge of our brand and then trust the brand to deliver. The influence of millennials is also helping shape our brands. 93% of millennials take selfies, no surprise. They take pictures of themselves for personal branding and they often add this to the that when they're publishing on social media, they add their location. Are they out and about? Are they out about at a cool location? They spend an average of 10 hours, 39 minutes in front of a screen every day. They have a high sense of entitlement and they love free. But free actually comes at a cost. If it's free, you can have all the information about my private life. Why do you think Facebook is free? Because they use all the information on you and sell it to marketing companies. Teens now spend more money on food than clothes because shared experiences creates can create stories for them. Instagram, people now eat with their phones first. Customers are always taking photos of their food. There's over 178 million posts of food on Instagram uh, with the hashtag food and 80 million with the hashtag food porn. <laughs> Bob Bob Rickard, which is a restaurant in London I've been to and it's famous for a button on every table saying press for champagne. Um, they sell 3,000 bottles of champagne a month. The owner, uh, Leonid Shutov, he realised the power of Instagram and invested in whiter plates, clearer logos, eye-catching new dishes that photograph beautifully. They also designed new coasters that provide a beautiful backdrop to drinks when you put them on there. Uh, in London, there's a small burrito chain called Bar Burrito, and they realised that people were posting loads of photos of their burritos, so they branded the boards they serve their food on so the brand is in every shot. 
So rose in New York City has the colour of the moment, which is called millennial pink, and it appeals to the Instagram nation. So the whole restaurant is this sort of pink. Um, so we need to anticipate our, cus our customers' visual taste correctly. Is our restaurant post worthy? Segmentation of our customers. The future restaurant has to be cognizant of what are some of the main drivers for dining decisions with different demographics. 20 to 40s look to choose for power and performance. 40s to 60s look for style and, maintenance, uh, style and status. And the 60 plus are looking for health maintenance. Other drivers of restaurant businesses. Other drivers of the restaurant business is emotion. So this is felt through a restaurant's unique story, and it must feel real. The future restaurant will express a story that resonates through every facet. Guests instinctively get the story and then connect with that story. So restaurants like um, Fleur's Place and Moraki, they have a great story to tell, and it draws customers in. And when you leave that restaurant after dining there, you'll be able to accurately articulate the same story of that restaurant everyone would be without trying too hard. So who else is um, important in helping restaurants of the future? Um, decision making. So the future restaurant needs to understand who is making the dining decisions. And sorry guys, it's not you. Women and then children have the most influence on the decision where the household income is spent. Women respond very strongly to powerful storytelling and emotion. And you get that right and you could be on to a winner. So motives for meals are also broken down into segments. Breakfast is sort of fit and healthy. Lunch nowadays is time saving convenience and dinner is where the fun and excitement is. So we have to make sure our restaurants can cover those three facets if we're going to be open for all those services. Social wellbeing. Restaurants are also an important expression of a social wellbeing of a city, region or even a country. They provide a canvas for us to showcase the talents of our farmers, <coughs> chefs and restaurateurs. These three strands combined and a willing customer base leads to high level of innovation and creativity. It is a unique relationship that we have with our customers. It's sort of a push me, pull you relationship. If the restaurant pushes too far to the edge um, for the customer, that the customer doesn't get it and it does not work. Or conversely, if the restaurants are not providing enough excitement and innovation, then the customers are not stimulated and become bored. And then that also does not work. We have to move forward sort of in lockstep. You probably have all seen examples of restaurants that did not work that were either humdrum or ahead of their time. The future restaurant is also influenced by landlords. Um, you see lots of many proposed multi-level developments, especially in Auckland. The designers always have pretty pictures of the ground floor with cafes overflowing with outside seating and customers. The reality is the rents are too high in these new spaces so that only multinational chains can afford them. New restaurants often tend to gravitate to locations that are off high, st high streets and side street locations. However, a trend is emerging whereby instead of just leasing to a heaver, we'll pay the highest rent. Some landlords are really realising that the right food operations have a positive influence on attracting tenants. In London, for example, the Bloomberg building, which cost about £1.5 billion, um, they had the Bloomberg magazine food critic choose nine different independent uh, London restaurants and cafes to fill the ground floor. They chose no multinational chains. Uh, Westfield, who opened um, all the food at One World in Lower Manhattan, um, they spent two years researching the best independent food operators in New York City and Brooklyn and then worked with them to be able to scale up to a, such a high volume precinct. This enlightened approach could influence developers here in New Zealand where they may look to take a similar line. Another influence in the New Zealand future New Zealand restaurant is the availability of suitable staff, especially in the kitchen. The shortage in cost of employing a brigade of highly trained chefs will see the rise of the simplification of restaurants. Already, and we see in London, with restaurants with a very narrow focus. Um, flat Island Steak, Burger and Lobster are two great examples. Flat Island Steak consists of one steak, five sides, four sauces and one dessert. Burger and Lobster has four burgers and a lobster. The places are flat out. Um, another Soho house, which has a lot of clubs in, around London and New York, they, they've got a, uh, a burger chain that only has three burgers for offer. Um, but it's full service with alcohol. Places does phenomenal business. They have a superstar chef that oversees the quality of the wall and makes sure that the food uh, is really up there. Um, so our sector has also been largely immune to technology having an impact, but that, that's changing fast. Um, the incursion of technology into the dining experience, food production and consumption patterns is having an effect. With technology enabling more efficient forms of food delivery, we don't even need to leave the house anymore to have a restaurant quality meal. Um, there's lots of subscription offerings too, like My Food Bag, Fresh Catch, Whoop, taking home delivery service from niche to mainstream. And the convenience of, of these food and Uber Eats could mean the decline of dining out. 
Whilst away from home consumption is increasing, this is partly driven by food delivery. And we need to ensure that even though we don't virtually interact with this guest, it still is a relationship and not a transaction if we're doing food delivery from our restaurants. The two anchors of our success, uh, operational excellence and the customer experience, so the emotional power is key. Um, we've seen robots and automated services replacing uh, reliance on humans in many other industries and will we'll be no exception. Um, in fact, these robots serving tables and preparing food may sound like something from a sci-fi film, but these innovations exist. Um, there's a Silicon Valley startup called Chowbotics. It's a device which we call Sally the Salad Robot. It's aimed at reducing the risk of foodborne illness by assembling salads out of pre-cut vegetables stored in refrigerated canisters. Diners use a touch screen to place their orders. Choosing from a menu of recipes will design their own salad. The machine calculates the number of calories per salad and drops them into a bowl. It all sounds a bit weird. Uh, in Auckland, there's an uh, ice cream chain called uh, Giappo Grizzoli, and they use 3D printing to create some of their ice cream artwork. So while there are benefits in terms of efficiency and cost cutting, uh, it suggests, there's also a suggestion that um, the future dining experience could lack sort of personal interaction. Um, two guys called the, uh, who have a company called the Tech, Restaurant Technology Guys, they predict the future restaurant will see fewer humans and more computers operating. Um, there's a restaurant in San Francisco called Itza. It's almost fully automated. Customers order on an iPad and collect the food from a cubby hole with no sign of human involvement. But I don't think it will last. But here, we've got it here with, um, you know, e at the airport, the kiosk, at the Koru Club, and KFC and McDonald's now have touch screens uh, in the restaurant, so you just go in and put your order on a touch screen and you just hear your number called out and you walk up. Um, the downside is the cost to commuters, consumers. Researchers suggest that when your server is a screen, you order more and spend more money because there's no risk of being judged. Think about that extra side of fries or dessert you add onto your Uber Eats order. If no one sees you do it, it doesn't count, right? <laughs> Though it may take away from that interactive element, technology can add an extra layer of experience to the dining occasion. The future is dining is likely to incorporate all of our senses into the creation of flavour, from sound to lighting and to everything in between. It's called neurogastronomy and is likely to play a major factor in future restaurant design. Um, the, company, big, the world's biggest drinks company, Diego, they found that curved furnishings and red lighting make single malt whiskies taste better. Similarly, the restaurant Ultraviolet in Shanghai pairs each dish on its main 20-course menu with wall projects, computerised lighting, scent diffusions and surround sound, all to intensify the taste of food. Um, we, we had the Nano Girl, does anyone know her, the scientist that writes? Um, she did a test on us at an event and um, she played two different types of music and we had to see whether the apparent sweetness in chocolate was sweeter or more bitter. And um, when she played classical music versus heavy rock, and everyone thought that the, the, the tasted much more sweeter when it was played with classical music. So it was really interesting. And she said she swore it was exactly the same chocolate. So there is some science behind it. Um, you'll all remember when Heston Blumenthal in 2007, when he did that ocean dish and he had to put an iPod on and listen to the sound of waves um, crashing on the sea seashore while you um, had a meal of seafood and everyone thought that it was amazing, the dish tasted amazing because of that. It looks a bit archaic now because now we can have uh, virtual reality uh, meals and um, and with virtual reality is um, you can have all the juicy steak you want minus the actual steak. So Project Nourished in Los Angeles, um, they put on virtual reality, they make customers put on virtual reality headsets, had aroma diffusers, 3D printed food made from low calorie vegan gelatin. Doesn't that sound awful? Um, and people thought they were eating steak because they, their brain made them think they were eating steak because they mimicked the texture and everything just using this stuff. So the virtual uh, reality concept, actually it was in um, Wellington on a plate. Um, the Thistle Inn used a virtual reality to tell the story of one of its meals. So from the catch, um, um, from catching it in the fishing boat, um, r right the way through to how it was cooked and everything. And so that was a bit of a virtual um, reality, but sort of not, not as horrible as the low calorie vegan gelatin. Um, so of course, Innovation won't only influence how we eat, but what we eat. We can already see changes in both the supply and demand of, fo of food, and as we know, there's a huge focus on sustainability. Plant-based products will continue to grow in popularity, and protein-centric dining plate may become a culinary anomaly with grain, legumes, and even insects taking centre stage. 
Some studies suggest meat will no longer be grown on farms but in a lab, and scientists are experimenting with more efficient and environmentally friendly ways of putting meat on our plates, which would free up enormous amounts of grazing land worldwide. So some final points that may have some resonance with you, your own thoughts. The future is not old, white, male and saturated. The future is young, female, fresh and Asian, and this is where we need to aim. Communication is more important than, than ever. Share and cooperate. And Wellington on a plate is a great example of this. Do not discount, avoid fair strategies whenever possible. We must turn bad news into good news. If we can't change things, then change the way we look at them, but be honest. We have to remember, service is the future. People like to look back at better times, so we need to celebrate the past in an innovative way to reconnect. Simplicity, so choice is less important than the right selection. Finally, when you go to a restaurant, can you feel it? Because remember, it's not about the money, it's about the mood. Thank you very much. We've got time for two questions. Hands up. Anyone with a question? You want the recipe for the vegan gelatin, don't you? <laughs> Go for it, Lee. What, what have you found by the way of good responses to the impact of urban eats? Uh, Uber Eats? Uber Eats, sorry. Um, oh, yeah. If it, if it plays too big a part in your business, it, you could suffer. But it, it, could, it, can, it can work if it's just a little portion and um, it's a, sort of a, use it as a bit of a marketing to have your name out there. But uh, I think it's a bit of a phase that we'll go through and we'll see. It'll just become more... I think McDonald's is the biggest food that they sell on Uber Eats. So it's sort of really good for fast food. Yeah. You know, but has there been a, what's the challenge to those? Because we did sort of do tap up for a while, but it didn't, it didn't sort of pick up hugely. No, because I think people want to have their own dish. You know, it's like when you go and you, you order the, the dish and then everyone else eats it, and you, you go, well, I ordered that, and everyone's went, oh, that looks better than what I ordered. Um, yeah, so I, I think that pe people do like to uh, um, eat their way still. And, and smaller portions is, is more. I mean, we were talking, someone was talking, we were talking about. Um, the green parrot, and they're really suffering, they said, but they're still doing the same big portions they always used to do, and people don't want to eat that way anymore, but they're too scared to sort of change it because they haven't moved with the times, and they might alienate their... Winston. Uh, they're scared. <laughs> well, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. Chris, come on up. Thank you. Um, I'm oh. sorry, I don't know how to talk here for a moment, mate. I don't think we've ever had quite so much information in 15 minutes ever before. <laughs> I was uh, reminded while I was listening to Mike that I've um, been planning for some time now to build a new restaurant in Tory Street and uh, I've gone into quite a lot of detail in my own mind and I've got an image of this restaurant and what sort of food we'll serve and so on. It's going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. In fact, the champagne I, no, I was thinking, yeah, is that we have that? But I was thinking, this mentoring program, I need Sam and Zoe advising me, <laughs> not Mike. So, anyway, Mike, thoroughly enjoyed your address. Here's a small gift from our Rotary Club. Now, we've been very, very careful about selecting this, and I know you'll enjoy our latest Rotary cookbook. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, if you'd all show your appreciation to Mike for coming along, thank you very much. Thank you.